Uh, I'd like to get started on a couple of slides uh, that try to say where were we before the, uh, the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, and then roughly where are we afterwards. Uh, now, I'm looking at doing this in four minutes, so we won't do it justice, but just to give a very high-level sense of where we were, where we are, and then we'll, of course, get into more details as we go forward next uh, on Tuesday. I'm sorry, on, on Thursday. I'm showing an example. OK, US parent has a US sub, and there are some foreign subsidiaries. Now, I don't know what you got into in your other courses, but a very fundamental thing in the corporate area is that US headquartered groups very, very, very often file consolidated tax returns. Very common. The reason for this dotted line around the two of them is to make the point that foreign subsidiaries are not included in the US consolidation. Now, for those of you who took 515, and again, we'll try to cover, recover a little bit of this ground on uh, Thursday, but foreign subsidiaries are not US taxpayers. Yes, they are if they have effectively connected income, if they have fixed and determinable annual or periodical income, which hopefully are terms that that you might recall from 515. But for this course, we will generally assume that those foreign subsidiaries do not have these other things. And in real life, they normally don't. So the US does not tax foreign subsidiaries. The income in the foreign subsidiaries, uh, the income of the foreign subsidiaries is not included in the US consolidation. Now, the prior deferral system, which is literally from, what, 19, I don't know, 1913 or whenever it was that uh, the income tax started, up until 2017, up through 2017, the system was what we called deferral, which meant that the income in this foreign sub, again, would not be taxable in the United States directly. And that is still true today. It will not be taxed directly. This foreign sub will not be itself a US taxpayer. And again, assuming no effectively connected income, no fixed and determinable annual or periodical income, only when that foreign sub pays a dividend will the US parent have income. That's the general rule. The principal exception, or you know, one of several exceptions, but let's say the principal exception for this discussion is that there's something called subpart F, which we will get into in much more detail, sections 951 through 965. Under certain circumstances, depending on what income is earned in that foreign subsidiary, the US parent would have to pretend that it had received the dividend. It would have to include an income, an amount not paid as a dividend, but would have to include an income and pay current tax on some portion of the income in this foreign sub if that portion met certain tests. And again, we'll get in later as to what those are. So overall, if the foreign sub stayed away from these things that caused immediately, immediate taxability in the US parent, then there would be no US tax at all either directly on the foreign sub 
or indirectly by taxing the foreign parent until a dividend is paid. That was deferral. Anybody remember what Tim Cook once said, I think, on 60 Minutes? Tim Cook? Tim Cook? Oh, my gosh. Tim Cook is the uh, CEO of Apple who took over after uh, Steve Jobs uh, unfortunately left us. When asked, why don't you bring some of that money home, he said, well, God, I'll never do that. It'll be taxed at 35%. Why would I ever do that? And the way the accounting rules are, uh, you know, I'm not accusing Tim Cook of anything. This is a more general uh, thing. Uh, the use of equity-based compensation where, uh, you know, the value of stock plays a big part of how much an executive makes there was a great amount of motivation to say, hey, I'm never going to bring that money home. Hence, Apple with its almost 250 million, uh, Microsoft with its 120 something, and so on. They basically, you know, does anybody, again, I don't know how much background you have on corporations, but does anybody say to you, gee, you must pay a dividend? There, there is a, um, uh, the name is eluding me at the moment, I want to say it's in 531, uh, accumulated earnings yes. tax? Yes. Uh, yeah, but that's generally not applied in these kinds of situations. And also, that's a tax, if I remember correctly, and God, it's been years since I've looked at it, that's a tax that is on the company which doesn't pay the dividend not on the shareholder, right? The point is that management was quite happy to never pay dividends back. They would borrow money, even though they had a lot of money in the foreign subs, they would borrow money at the US parent level for their cash needs. And you know, so the tax system is making them do, in a manner of speaking, unnatural things. So one of the goals of the December 2017 Tax Cuts and Jobs Act was to uh, eliminate this encouragement to leave money outside the United States. Okay, let's uh, go ahead and get started. Uh, now, uh, last time when uh, uh, when we uh, uh, finished up, we had just uh, started looking uh, at, uh, we had looked briefly at this slide. And what I'd like to do tonight uh, is to cover, uh, let's say, some basics that I will call building blocks that are important uh, for the rest of the course, as well as for your understanding of how things work in the tax area. So uh, the goal is to try to get through as much as we can uh, for basic understanding of the system that we're operating within, the environment that we're operating within. Now, what I'd like to do is to uh, change over to the document camera and to draw some pictures. Let's say we have company X. We have the US. This is the border in case it wasn't uh, clear. And we have, let's just call it outside the US. Under uh, okay, and also this discussion uh, will assume, for the most part, uh, a U.S. headquartered, you know, publicly held group of companies, uh, as opposed to an individual owning uh, a foreign company or something like that. 
Uh, if you have questions about that, we can cover that as well. But in terms of the broad area that I think a lot of you will be working in, it will be in the corporate sphere. And again, there are some basics that need to be clear in your mind as we go forward. Now, to sort of make it look a little bit like that other, that other slide I had up, we had uh, the company owning a U.S. subsidiary, let's call that uh, Y, and a foreign subsidiary, which we'll call Z. Now, when we look at our U.S. tax system, X is a U.S. taxpayer. It's a U.S. corporation. The U.S. has jurisdiction over it. And it's easy for the U.S. because of that to tax X on its worldwide income. Y is a subsidiary, 100% owned. Now what about that subsidiary? Is that a separate taxpayer from X or is that uh, just included in X's, uh, in X, uh, included in X's results of operations. Yeah. Can't they do a unified return? Or? Ah, yes, they can. And we'll get to that in a moment. Excellent. The first point, though, is that X and Y are two separate legal entities. They are each incorporated in whatever, uh, in whatever state uh, or perhaps under federal charter. Uh, uh, there, you can run into that occasionally. So they are separate taxpayers. Yes, if X and Y elect, they can file a consolidated US return so that in one Form 1120, which is the corporate tax return, they will include the results of both of their uh, income and expenses. But they are separate legal entities. And uh, as we'll speak later on, even though from a tax perspective they may have elected consolidated treatment so that for federal tax purposes they are filing one combined, so to speak, consolidated tax return, they are still separate legal entities and if, for example, you were employed by this group, you would be you know, you would have to look at your uh, employment agreement and you'd say, well, gee, who's my employer? Well, it's either X or Y. It's not both. If the group decides to do business with the third party, they have to decide which company is going to enter into the contract with the vendor or the customer or whatever it is. Now, if uh, now here in this classroom, okay, you know we're all looking at things in a very you know legalistic fashion because gee, this is a course in the law school. But for anybody outside of this, the boundaries of this school, this law school, if they, if you find somebody who says he's working for General Motors. He probably has no idea which legal entity within the General Motors group he is working for. He might say, well, gee, uh, I'm working for the, uh, uh, the Cadillac division, or I'm working for the Pontiac division. Is the Pontiac division still around? Uh, uh, that's the one that left us. I think Buick is still around? Yeah, Buick's still around. Buick is <laughs> okay. Yeah, I, I picked Pontiac because I, I thought I remembered that it was no longer with us. Okay. 
The point is, you've got in the tax area to remember that a legal entity is a legal entity and it is for all legal purposes, except if there's a consolidated filing election having been made, then they file one tax return. Now, my experience is that because of this consolidated approach that uh, is so pervasive throughout large corporations, and this is not the class to spend time talking about why so many groups use a consolidated filing approach, let's just say that a lot do, probably I don't know, maybe 99%, although I'm, I'm probably, uh, probably overstating it, but I'm sure not by much of large groups file consolidated returns. Well, because of that, my experience is that people are sloppy. They don't think about which legal entity is the appropriate one for this transaction or that transaction or uh, who an employee should work for. In the tax area, all of these things matter. Uh, maybe I'll say it again sometime later in the course, but I don't know how many times I've asked a client, uh, would you please give me uh, a copy of the agreement that we've been discussing uh, that's been, you know, been in place for the last five years? And he'll respond, you don't need to say, you don't need to see it. I mean, you don't need to spend time on it and charge me for it. Uh, you don't need to say it because what it says is ABC. Now, I have always been aggressive in asking for copies of agreements like that. At least 50% of the time, somewhere, somehow, what he tells me is factually wrong. That's not what the agreement says. People forget they're not they're not doing it uh, intentionally to mislead you. They're doing it because gee, they think that's what it says. Maybe they read it uh, three years ago. Maybe they didn't. But people don't know what's in their agreements. And then secondly, unless you're the type who's overjoyed to be in this kind of class, you know you don't care. Uh, about these kinds of details. Yet in the tax area and very much in the international tax area, these things matter. So which company is doing something is very important. Now, I had said with the, uh, with the other uh, slide, uh, last week, that the consolidated filing includes only these companies. It does not include the overseas subsidiary. Does the overseas subsidiary get included in financial statements that are issued to uh, uh, that are issued to, under the SEC rules to investors and other interested parties? Yeah, it, uh, those are included. Okay, so we have uh, a situation where taxation on a current basis in the United States is on these two companies and not on these, uh, not on a Z here, which we are so assuming, uh, again, for those of you who took 515, that uh, does not have any effectively connected income, it has no US <laughs> trader business, it has no fixed and determinable annual or periodical income from US sources. So we're saying that Z is not a US taxpayer in any way. Could 
Z be a taxpayer? Somewhere? Do you think other countries have income taxes imposed on corporations? Yes, they do. So let's put another border here. And let's say that instead of just saying outside the US, let's say that this is country A and this over here is country B. Now, since Z is established in country A, maybe Z is a tax resident of country A and taxable on its worldwide income in country A. Now, I said maybe. The U.S. is pretty unique in a, uh, is pretty unique in looking to location of formation as the sole criteria of residency for tax purposes. Most other countries, at least that I have run into, use uh, location of management and control and sometimes will also include any company that is formed, established under that country's laws. So it's very possible, it's very possible that Z, depending on its, the factual situation behind it, it's very possible that Z is non-resident of country A, it's, of course, possible that it is resident in country A and taxable in country A on its worldwide income. Now, Z could also have activities in country B. Maybe it has an office. Maybe it makes sales into country B, maybe it provides services and it has customers in country B. Country B, just like you studied in T515 for foreign parties who are conducting business or have, have income from uh, the United States, country B looks at non-residents and can tax them on some, some items. So uh, Z there is potentially subject to tax in country A. It's subject to ta potentially subject to tax in country B. But it's not currently taxable by the US. Now, I mentioned about, uh, about uh, uh, consolidated financial statements uh, a moment or two ago. And uh, as you confirmed, several of you confirmed, the income or expense in country Z, I'm sorry, in, uh, the, the income or expense in Z is not included within the consolidated results for US tax purposes. Uh, but for financial statement purposes, it is. So let's say that the consolidation up here has 100 of income, and let's say there's a 100 of loss down here in Z. What's the financial statement, uh, financial statement net income before taxes in this situation? Zero, yeah. It's zero. The, for financial statement purposes, the investors want to know whether the whole group had income or expense. But what's the income for current US federal tax purposes in this consolidation? 100. 100, right. So as a result, there would be a current tax of 21, current rate, 21% uh, flat rate in the United States. So 
there would be a current tax of 21, despite the fact that there is a zero financial statement income before tax. Now, this is the kind of terrible result you don't want to see. So, you know, how things are organized uh, and uh, set up, uh, you know, makes a difference. In any case, uh, the uh, the point as we go forward is that we have to know whether a transaction is being conducted by X or Y, or whether that transaction is being conducted by Z, in order to know where the income and expenses go. Because where the income and expenses go, that makes a big difference regarding what country can grab a piece of it. And how each country calculates the tax. Now, from this, let's, let's assume for the sake of uh, discussion that uh, we no longer are speaking about you know, 100 and 100, but uh, rather, let's say that, uh, that uh, X has a, uh, let's say that, uh, I'm sorry, uh, let's say that A is a zero or low tax country. Is there a, uh, is there an incentive for X to put more income in Z if it can? Is there an incentive to put more income in the Z and less in X and Y? Yeah. There, and this is consistent with what we've seen over the past several decades of US groups being very strong about pushing more and more income into their low-taxed foreign subsidiaries. 